So, this is my ancient Chaos Army, and I'd like to show it to you. This army is 100% lead, and I can barely carry it. It's also nearly 100% 1980s, with models from Warhammer 3rd Edition. I've collected and painted this army over a very long time, and yes, it cost me an arm and a leg. Now before I show you the actual units in this army, I wanted to just say a little bit about what my motivations were for collecting an army like this. Now most people who are into Old Hammer, that is to say miniatures from the 1980s and the early 1990s, are into it because it was their time as gamers. They grew up with 3rd edition, and it was the gaming system that they played they were the models that they remembered, and that they're the models that they love. But I'm a man of a slightly later time, and this army is really a sentimental love letter to a time before my own. A time when Warhammer was visceral and evocative. Where Games Workshop were a company of metal-headed, passionate young men with long hair before the coming of a relentless focus on shareholder returns. Where artists had freedom to express the world Miniature designers made 25 champions of Slanesh, and the spiralling ambition of the game produced a chaos rulebook over 600 pages in length throughout the Slaves to the Darkness and the Lost and the Dam that took years to release. This was barely a company thinking commercially. It was animated by creativity, and its output was rambling and chaotic, sometimes brilliant, at other times incomprehensible. It was the time of inspired young men who lit up the high streets of sleepy provincial English towns with their power metal fueled brilliance and their LSD inspired idealism. This wasn't a grim dark universe of unrelenting war. It was camp, it was bombastic, it was cheesy and it didn't take itself too seriously. It didn't matter that you couldn't understand it, or only caught a fleeting glimpse of it as I did. It was so beautiful, so naive, so inspirational, that those who saw it, even though they may have enjoyed themselves in the years that followed, could never really love anything in quite the same way. Now all of this is very whimsical and sentimental, and will obviously be lost on those of you who are younger, or those of you who simply haven't dialed in to the amazing Fantasia that was Games Workshop in the 1980s. But to explain this in more earthly terms, I saw enough of models from the late 1980s in White Dwarf magazines, or on those seminal combat cards, the Greybeards will remember what I mean there, to be inspired by them and to want to own them. Now, to the school kid looking at Games Workshop stores in the age of 4th edition and 5th edition, there weren't really any of these models about. Now, you could order them through the amazing and sadly discontinued back order catalogue that used to exist in Games Workshop, where you could order literally any model from any era, even the hind leg of a dragon from 1988. But these models remain something fleeting and unobtainable to me on my pocket money budgets, and many of my memories were spent flicking through a falling to bits 1986 to 1991 Citadel collection catalogue, which in the age before the internet was really the only way you could get a comprehensive catalogue of these models. Even though the 1980s were then a lot more recent, they somehow felt a lot further away, and owning models like this remained only a dream. But years and years later, when I had the money to buy them, I started ordering them off eBay. Now, I wanted to paint these in a very specific way, which was to capture the way they were painted contemporaneously in the 1980s, which was extreme retina-burning brightness, layer upon layer upon layer, to try and make models pop out of a dull photograph or smash their way across the table into the optic nerve of anyone who came remotely near them. Even if it was in the smoky, dimly lit, beer-stained floor environment of the Grimsby Working Man's Club, you would be able to tell that Warhammer was being played with models painted like that. 80s metal album covers, arcade machines and early consoles, and 80s anime. These were all the heady aesthetic inspirations for this army. Along the way, it also became very personal, and many of the banners you can see on these units are things that matter a lot to me. Generally, characters or moments from role-playing games that I played long ago. 
Now, as I went down this eccentric lead rabbit hole to the 1980s, I realised that I wanted more. And that was to paint these models with the right sort of paint, of the kind that was around then. And so almost all of this army is painted with the first edition or the second edition hexagonal era paint pots that were contemporaneous to those times, and despite what is often said now, were miles better than the paint you get today. Yes, you didn't go and put paint in that era through a spray gun or slap on contrast paint, oh no. You diluted it so it was around the consistency of milk and built up layer after layer after layer on the model. That was how people painted then, sometimes taking days to finish even a single model rather than trying to batch paint a regiment in 24 hours. There was also lots of freehanding encouraged in those days, on banners and even on shields. And armies took years to collect, with even experienced players maybe only having a couple of different ones. A very different gaming meta and collecting meta to what you see today. So, for those of you who are still with me and have sat through that rather bizarre dispatch, it's time to crank up the dial on the time machine and go back to the first regiment that I painted for this army, which was these Chaos Hounds. Now, I realise that these Chaos Hounds aren't actually from the 1980s at all. They're one of the very few things in the army that aren't. They're from around the mid-1990s. These are 5th edition Chaos Hounds, and I really used these as a laboratory to try to work out how to paint. Now, while I hadn't painted anything, literally since I was at school, I did have something of a head start in that I had spent a number of years drawing anime and comics for a hobby, and so I was trying to translate what I knew about drawing in 2D to painting in 3D. Now one of these Chaos Hound sculpts, this one with the scorpion tail, is actually a bit anomalous in that it's actually a model from the 1980s that was somehow resurrected and I think its wings snapped off it and turned into a Chaos Hound. As for the rest of them, there are a couple of interesting personalities in here. One of them is the Mount of Ogla Khan, the Hobgoblin. I think he's called Warn. That's the chap there on the right here. And this one on the left was one where I did a little bit of colour transition from one side of the Chaos Hound to the other. And at the time, I was rather pleased with it. Now, there are actually three eras of Chaos Hounds, of which the ones you just saw were the third. These ones here are the very first edition Chaos Hounds from 1987, and I think these are absolutely fabulous models. Now they are, as you can see, much smaller. They are also much more dog-like. Some of them really do actually just look like dogs with quite minimal mutations. But you see, I really like this minimalism. I like the fact that there's one Chaos Hound who's got the scorpion tail, one that looks a bit sort of undead, one who's got two heads, and then others who have got a few other features like spikes. It made you just want to collect all of the Chaos Hounds in the set, rather than having just to do everything on a single model and go really over the top, which is obviously the trend that miniatures have taken in more modern times. This unit is also, I think, one of those that works fantastically for multiple colours. In that you can paint each Chaos Hound its own very vivid colour and then rank them all up and they look like a packet of felt tip pens in a school pencil case and really pop off the table. I'd also one day like to do a unit of second edition Chaos Hounds who are also fabulous models and aesthetically sit between these two eras that I've just shown you. But Chaos Hounds, of course, always a ubiquitous staple in a Chaos Army, pretty much whatever edition you play. And so these Chaos Hounds have seen many, many battles. Next up is our Nurgle Chaos Warriors. Now, I decided that I wanted to paint a unit of Chaos Warriors for each of the gods. And this one is my Nurgle one. Now, in terms of painting, I think this is probably technically the most successful. I kept to a fairly minimal colour scheme, that being Dark Angels Green, Goblin Green, Scorpion Green, and then Rotting Flesh for the final highlight. Now some of the Chaos Warriors sculpts here, as you can see, do lend themselves a bit more to Nurgle, some of the ones that look a bit more sort of rotten and a bit more sort of skull-like, but some of the others are a bit more generic and could have easily been painted in the liveries of any of the Chaos Gods, or of course none at all. 
I can't leave without remarking about that unit filler that's there at the back. Now, this is a rather eccentric object because this was actually purchased from an airport in Hong Kong. It's actually a Feng Shui money toad. And when I saw it, I thought this might make rather a good toad dragon. And so I bought it and painted it in the same colors as my unit of warriors. Now, obviously, because I'm only relatively seldom putting a toad dragon on the table, he's actually got perhaps more of a life as a unit filler in this unit of Nurgle warriors, allowing me really to put a pretty colossal Death Star on the table. The banner on this unit is a very personal one and probably take me about five minutes to explain, so I'm not going to for this video is long enough as it is. Now, here are some warriors that I think are amongst the more distinctive ones in the unit. The chap there on the left is important to me because he's one of the relatively few models in this army that I actually purchased from a store as a contemporary. He didn't come off mail order, he was actually purchased by me. To his right, we've got the Kinky Chaosette. Now, this is a very famous miniature which Greybeards will remember well because she was on the front of a White Dwarf magazine, a John Blanche illustration of a Lady Chaos Warrior with an afro and towering heels, all very 1980s. And I really like this model, and she's actually got one of the only hand-painted shields that I did on the whole regiment. Then to the right of her, we've got the chap in bone armour. Now, this is one of the very popular Chaos Champions that you see remembered by legend. Generally speaking, his armour is done in bone, unlike the green that I've done him here. Then to his right, you've got this awesome cool dude with his arms akimbo, who is of course Karth Skullface from the combat cards. I always wanted to own this model, and it's quite a rare one and was quite hard to find, but eventually I managed to secure it. Then to his right, we've got Festus. Now, he's not strictly Festus, of course, the 8th edition Plague Doctor special character, but he's a model that looks damn like Festus. And this model actually was the inspiration for, I can't remember which it was, one of those characters released in the Glockin book. Looks exactly like him facially. So a model from the 1980s there, actually inspiring a much, much later sculpt some 25 years later. Anyway, I use him to represent Festus if I'm playing 8th edition. And then finally, we've got the Chaos Wizard. Now, again, this is a, one of the very famous and desirable Chaos Champions from this era. The mysterious cowl with no face. All a bit trick-or-treat, cheesy, Halloween-y, look behind you, kiddies. Really cool. A few more dudes here. There's this guy with the skull face and the skull shield, which is actually from 5th edition. There's the guy with the purple sword there. It's a miniature I really like. I think it's got a fantastic dynamism about it and a real power behind the pose. And then there's actually the guy in the center there who is actually a Bretonian foot knight who I decided to paint up in the colors of Nurgle. Right, onto my Zinch Stroke Slanesh Warriors. I've always felt that Zinch and Slanesh were aesthetically more similar to each other than the other Chaos Gods are, so I decided that one regiment of warriors could cover both. This is a unit that's predominantly blue and pink, and I painted some of the ones towards the back of the unit, really towards the beginning of when I began painting. When I started getting better, I also moved on to some of the more ambitious Chaos Champion kinds of sculpts that are a little bit more complicated than some of the more simple armoured ones. The banner on this unit, the Panic Project, that lady on the banner is called Alpha Paris, and she was an evil scientist who experimented in all sorts of humans in a place called the Agnew Mountains in a mysterious game long forgotten. Pulling out this front rank here in more detail, we've got the chap here on the left with the open book. He's from Combat Cards, and he was always one of the Chaos Champions I really wanted to own as a kid. I got the model relatively early, but I wanted to feel as though I could do the miniature justice before I actually painted it. The chap there on the right, just a really cool Chaos Warrior sculpt, I think. I've actually got two of him, one also in the corn unit as well. And he's got one of, I think, one of my more successful free-handed shields there of a kind of sort of forest spirit leering at you. 
Then we've got the guy here, the moon guy, who points at his adversaries, one of the real classic champions of Zinch. Then to his left, this cool guy here with a sword, who I just think I got a really nice definition on his very basic armor. And then Jacob Warptail, the bald guy with a snaky tail. Again, one of the really iconic 1980s Chaos Champions, and actually a model that was brought back many, many years later at the time when Chaos was released in 5th edition. He uniquely, no others. A few more nice ones here, I think, uh, using also the moon theme on a couple of these warriors to complement the Chaos Champion with the moon face, and a few actual shields used from other places. The moon shield there is a goblin shield from the 4th ed box set and the shield on the far right of the kind of leering purple demon, that's again a 1980s shield from a place I'm not really sure where. There's also a Chaos Beastmaster here you can see as well, second from the left. He's actually holding a whip in the original sculpt but that broke off and so I replaced it with a sword. Right, onto some Jabberwockies here, and well, these really scream old hammer. Now, I'm very privileged to have as many of these pretty rare sculpts as I do. Generally, you might see people having one Jabberwocky or two, but to have eight of them, well, oh, that's pretty impressive. Now, these Jabberwockies are so cool because, like Pink Horrors, they take advantage of something you could do with metal models, which is bending them. So these Jabberwockies have their heads bent into all sorts of different positions and their wings as well to create very dynamic poses despite it actually just being a monopose model. Now these Jabberwockies I actually brought off eBay and they were fairly well painted at the time so I only actually just added a few highlights to them and based them to actually get them into my army for one of my earliest units, generally using them as Chaos Trolls in 8th edition. Now, upcycling models that you buy that someone else has painted is a quite interesting thing in itself. Sometimes, if it's reasonably well painted, you just put a wash on it and then also put some highlights on it and maybe put some black lining in as well and you'll get actually a quite presentable unit. There does, of course, reach a point when the number of post edits that you're doing to someone else's painting just becomes so great that you may as well just strip it and start over. But I always thought these Jabberwockies were good enough for me to continue with, even though I can see quite a lot of mistakes and shortcomings on them now. So, on to the War Shrine, and this was one of the earliest models that I painted for my army, although it's still one of my favourites. It's converted from a model that I always owned, which was a Skaven Doomwheel and I stuck a sort of demon face on it from a more contemporary set of plastics and then moulded a platform to go on the top, creating the floorboards on it myself with a scalpel. That strong box you can see there at the back was actually sculpted by Rick Priestley, who was obviously much better known as a games designer. The banner at the back, Perfect Truth, this was one of my earlier banners, but it's still one of my favourites because I just think the image really pops. The lady on that banner is actually a sort of weird disciple of Sailor Neptune from Sailor Moon who got transported into another universe where she became something of a fortune teller. Now, those models that are riding on the War Shrine, the Minotaur and the Astropath, are of course from the board game Talisman. Now, many of you may have heard of Talisman, which has had some modern incarnations, but it was in the late 1980s a board game that was very simple to play and was produced by Games Workshop, but just represented, I guess, a kind of a fun distraction from the main offering, which was war games. There were some Talisman miniatures that were produced, including for all of the supplements, and I've collected all of them, and painted perhaps around half. And so what I do with the War Shrine is I just actually cycle between the Talisman miniatures. Maybe one week it's got the Philosopher and the Prophetess on the top of it. Maybe another week it's the Orc and the Pilgrim. But this week it's the Minotaur and the Astropath. The Minotaur perhaps being one of my favourite of the Talisman miniatures and the Astropath actually being the first ever Talisman miniature I painted and the first who rode on this war shrine. So I decided that he should be one of the ones who stands atop it here for this photograph. Next are my Corn Warriors and these were the first unit of Chaos Warriors that I painted. 
They're actually my favourite of my Chaos Warrior units, even though I think the paint job is the roughest. I developed a way of painting bright red that I really like. This was Crimson Gore, Blazing Orange, Fiery Orange, and then Sunburst Yellow to finish. It's also got my first and favourite of my free-handed banners in the army, this being the Welcome to the Machine banner. That lady on the banner is a fictitious dominatrix called Sakura from a role-playing game. And I painted this whole banner, including the lettering, on a single piece of overloaded paper. With some of the other banners that you'll see on some of my other units, I actually layered them up, which is to say some of the things in the images were painted separately and then glued onto the top. The banners in this army are of course one of the things that people find the most distinctive about it. They represented a really cool opportunity to personalise the army, and also to make use of some of my experience drawing comics. All of the banners I try to coordinate with the regiment that marches beneath them, and this one I think is one of the most successful in terms of really looking as though it belongs to the unit. I began by putting my standards in the front rank, as you traditionally are supposed to, but as my banners became larger and more elaborate, I decided to move them over to the back rank, which meant that you could still see the banner, but also have it so that they didn't over-dominate the unit that was marching beneath them. A closer look here at three of the warriors I tend to place on the front rank, and I do this in the case of the three that don't have the banner because they've got hand-painted shields, all of which I'm really rather pleased with. The one on the left, I think, just a nicely executed leering face. The one with the kind of sort of anchor butter cow, I actually just did that with no reference and just made up the face and it ended up taking that kind of a form. The one on the right there carrying the banner has got one of those really cool old hammer shields with the four spikes. I came to freehanding shields quite some time after I freehanded banners and I wouldn't say I'm really very experienced at it, only doing some of the more basic kind of face designs but I think they're a really cool way to add some extra personality to your units. And you could just have a couple of them here and there and place them in your front rank to get some real distinctiveness. They're also, of course, super 1980s because free-handed shields were absolutely a thing in that era, as you'll see if you look at the combat cards. Modern miniatures don't really tend to go in for this in the same kind of way, with shields having lots of detail that you can pick out rather than a blank canvas for you to put your own details in. That's actually something in general that I really like about models from this era. Generally, they're very simple and they have large flat surfaces, especially models like Chaos Warriors. This means that if you like adding your own detail to the miniatures, rather than merely picking out what a brilliant sculptor has left you, these models can represent a really, really cool canvas for you to express yourself with. I really like that as a painter. I find it very democratic and empowering. I find with modern models, sometimes it feels as though I'm being asked to jump through hoops by picking out this detail and then that detail, and it can feel a little bit paint by numbers sometimes. With these, there's real ability to express yourself because the sculptors didn't put that much detail on them. Just another five really cool guys here, I think. You notice the one on the left has actually got some kind of 40k weapon. There are a few of those in this army. And that of course harkens back to the odd fusion that there was between fantasy and 40k in the 1980s. And of course it wasn't impossible for a chaos champion to actually get a chaos reward, for example a heavy las cannon in one of his hands, or potentially getting his legs replaced by tank treads. All of this was possible in those magnificently long D1000 mutation tables that dominated Slaves to the Darkness and the Lost and the Damned. You've also got this guy with his multicoloured sword, which looks a little bit like an ice cream, but never mind. And then also some other really cool models, with that one on the right there with the mohawk being a sort of a marauder miniature. There are the odd few models in this army that do have that kind of punky kind of style, which of course was quite contemporaneous, especially amongst some of the Chaos Thug kind of sculpts. Now next up is a unit of Pink Horrors. Now there aren't very many demons in this army, and that's because I've really always played Warhammer in a time when demons weren't really included within the main Chaos Warrior armies. Now with these pink horrors, 
These were painted because I was attending a 6th edition Warhammer tournament, where of course I could have demons in the same army as warriors. That's incidentally something I really like. I really like the idea of having especially a mono-god chaos army where you've got some zinch warriors and some zinch knights alongside some zinch demons. But of course, that's not the way that later editions of Warhammer Fantasy tended to go. But anyway, I've got these really cool pink horrors here and I really like this unit for a number of reasons. The first are that the sculpts have so much personality. They are incredibly cool. And you know, they are one of these regiments where the fact that they are lead makes them so much more customizable. You can bend every hand and every finger into any pose that you want and get something that looks incredibly cool with these jazz hands pink horrors. Abetted by such colours as titillating pink, I think I managed to get a really retina murdering paint job on these. The banner on this unit, Smash the Mirror, is super cheesy. A sexy lady being attacked by a demon in a shower, the kind of thing that used to happen in the 1980s all the time. That dude there on the left with a grinning face is just a singular flamer of zinch. What a fantastic miniature that is. I really, really like painting demons because generally a lot of them are just a single color that you can really, really go to town with. And I've got some blood letters, I've got some plague bearers, I've got some demonettes, all the fabulous 1980s sculpts, which in my opinion absolutely knock the spots off anything that's come afterwards. I'm really looking forward to adding them to this Chaos Army one day and making it a truly representative Chaos Army, which has warriors, demons, and of course beastmen in it, as was originally intended. Next up is this giant. Of course, he's the classic Marauder Miniatures giant, a very famous model even to this day. Now, there were some really cool other giants that were actually made by GW from around this era, or actually a little bit before this guy, such as the legendary Citadel giant, a model I'd really like to own one day, but one of the rarest models that Games Workshop has ever produced. But that's not to diminish the more common Marauder giant that we have here, who is also an absolutely fantastic and iconic miniature. This model was actually one of the relatively few expensive box sets that I purchased as a kid at school. So it was really nice to paint him up after he'd been lying in a box for probably around a decade and a half to see battle again. Speaking of ultra rare miniatures, this next miniature is the Ass Cannon, which was a limited edition model from the late 1980s. Now, I tell a lie because this model that you see here is not the original sculpt. This is a brilliant and very faithful fan sculpt recreation of the original. Now, I did once own that original limited edition cannon that I got very fortunately off an eBay auction that was bundled in with other things, and even I didn't really realize what it was. However, it was worth so much money that I had to sell it. However, this fan recreation does really capture the spirit of the original in all of the important ways. And of course, it's an absolutely ludicrous concept. The idea of a chained up demon firing things out of its backside. And that symbolizes another thing that I really like about 1980s Warhammer, which was the cheesy sense of humor that was always there. There was a real liking for the ridiculous and the absurd. And occasionally this was mixed in with some satire as well. There wasn't a dull, dark, unremitting universe of endless war. No, it was camp, it was cheesy, and it was funny. Now, this canon only had very vague and unofficial rules, even in 3rd ed. But come 7th edition, the Hell Cannon appeared. And the Hell Cannon, in many ways, is a spiritual successor to the Ass Cannon, which itself had Chaos Dwarf crew, just as the Hell Cannon does. Next up, we've got a real burly heavy metal unit, and I mean that in all senses of the term. It's the Skull Crushers, the Juggernauts of Corn. This is one of the heaviest units in the army, weighs an absolute ton and is an absolute pain in the ass to wheel around the battlefield. But these are some of my favorite old hammer models. I think they're absolutely fantastic. 
Now, these juggernauts are really static kind of sculpts, which I think really suits the juggernaut as a beast, which isn't something that's lithe and I feel would run around very much. They look a little bit like Chinese restaurant crouching lions. But the juggernaut miniatures were sculpted with around four different heads, of which I've got three. Two of the riders here, the two in the centre, were actually some of the Chaos Champions that came with the original Juggernauts, and one of them is actually wielding a power axe in another really cool, weird, sort of 40k kind of throwback. The two miniatures on the left and the right are actually Chaos Warriors that I converted to sit on the Juggernauts, and I'm particularly fond of the chap there on the left with the blue skin. Now these juggernauts are not the best painted miniatures in the army, but I do think my painting plan was the best. Which is to say that I managed to coordinate three main colours for the actual juggernauts themselves. That is a brass, a green and a deep kind of crimsony red, which I deliberately picked to contrast from the bright fiery red of the armour. I used those colours interchangeably on the four juggernauts, painting different parts of the creatures those different colours to give them a great deal of internal variety while maintaining a unified colour scheme for the unit itself. The banner on this unit is one of relatively few that is a more warhammer banner, in that it's just a picture of a juggernaut, which was actually sketched from Inquisitor Barbaretta's Cyber Mastiff from the Inquisitor game. I think that the colours on this banner again complement the unit very nicely and it's also got a really cheesy slogan on it to boot. There's a single hand painted shield on this unit which I'm also very fond of and I think I managed to get quite a lot of detail onto a small space to make a kind of grimacing demon. For those interested in the history, these models weren't actually skull crushers originally in 3rd edition. They were actually just champions of corn who had demonic mounts. But because in those days, Games Workshop made so many different variations of champions, for example, getting around 20 or 25 different champion sculpts for all of the Chaos Gods, that they went and made something ridiculous like eight different variations of a Chaos Champion on a Juggernaut, even though it was almost infeasible, given how expensive these units were in terms of points, that any gamer was really going to have more than one. Next we've got the Plague Cart. Now this was a miniature that had, as far as I'm aware, fairly unofficial rules which were written on the box. And it's just a very small chariot with a very very cheesy Halloweeny Grim Reaper sitting on it. I think this is a really really cool model and it's one that I'd actually wanted to own for a long time but hadn't been able to find. I did some little conversions on the miniature, for example sticking that shield that you can see on that yellow banner, which has what almost looks like a direct proxy of the guy who's actually driving the wagon. I use the play cart to represent a gore beast chariot if I'm playing 8th edition. Speaking of chariots, next up we've got my long-suffering Warriors of Chaos chariot, and this is a model that has played in probably more than a hundred battles. It's almost been a ubiquitous pick in whatever kind of Chaos army that I'm using. It's an exceptionally cheesy in-camp model with a big grimacing demon on the front of the chariot. Now, the original horses that were pulling this sculpt were the really crappy plastic white horses from the 1980s. Now, I'm not normally critical of many 1980s sculpts, but those white plastic horses, which looked as though they might as well have come out of a children's farmyard set, were crap. So I decided to replace these horses with some others. Now, while there are some awesome metal horses that GW did in the 1980s, and I've used those elsewhere, I decided that here was one of the rare occasions where I might bring in some slightly more modern models. Only slightly more modern mind, mid to late 1990s. And these Chaos Steeds are ones that were actually released alongside a Chaos Lord at the time of 5th edition. And I had a couple of these. And so I decided to incorporate them as creatures pulling this chariot. Because the horses to me really looked as though they were going at full pelt and really suited a chariot. 
Because I was really into making banners at this stage, I decided to put one on the chariot as well and got a really cheesy leering looking monster to place on the banner. This is actually a thing called the evil monster from a video game called Shining Force CD from many years ago. Next we've got the Chimera. Me and this creature are in a semi-abusive relationship. The reason being because in 8th edition fantasy, Chimera is one of the best pieces in the Chaos book, but this Chimera has got itself into all manner of stupid situations and let me down so frequently. Now there are a variety of 1980s Chimera sculpts. There's a Citadel one, there's a Marauder one, and there's a Royal Partha one as well, all of which I really like. The only trouble with these is that they're really, really small, like quite a lot of monsters of this era. And really, if you want to use a Chimera in 8th edition fantasy, it's got to fit feasibly on a chariot base. So in the end, while I would one day like to paint the Citadel and Marauder Chimeras, both of which I do possess, I ended up getting a fan sculpt of a 1980s style Chimera. And there are some really, really good 80s style fan sculptors that are producing old hammer style like miniatures and this chimera was a fantastic example. Like the chimera this is another very cartoony miniature, the Grenadier Spider. Now Grenadier were one of those other companies that were making miniatures in the late 1980s and occasionally while they weren't as good as Citadel or Marauder they came up with the odd absolute classic and one of these is I think this spider. Lacking any real rules in any edition of Warhammer, this spider has tended to fill in for other sorts of monsters, sometimes a Chaos Spawn or in 8th edition a Great Spined Chaos Beast. Next up a few more demons and these are some Chaos Furies or could feasibly stand as harpies. The models are of course the demonettes from the Middle Hammer era and they've got Middle Hammer era harpy wings stuck on the back of them. Now these were actually some models that I managed to order off eBay and they had already been converted by an inventive gamer and he'd actually already painted them actually quite nicely and so this was one of these examples of where I actually upcycled the miniatures working very hard on the flesh, the claws and the wings to get more definition and I think that they worked out really quite well although I haven't had the chance to use them in many battles. Next up we have two dragons, the lava dragon on the left and the horned dragon on the right. These are just two of the absolutely jaw-dropping range of dragons sculpted by Nick Bibby. And these sculpts, for reasons I really don't understand, don't have too many people shouting about them. But I think they're some of the best miniatures that Games Workshop produced in the late 1980s. And these two are amongst my favourites. The Lava Dragon on the left, an absolutely fantastic dynamic model with an enormous long snake-like body that wraps round in a complicated way. He's got fantastic wings, a really cool face and the whole body is lithe and full of motion. I think the Lava Dragon might be my single favourite miniature of all time and yet it's not one that anyone really says much about. The Horned Dragon, also absolutely fantastic. A more static kind of sculpt, but it's got a real kind of elegance to it and looks really villainous and really cool. There are some other great dragons also in this series, like the Nightmare Dragon, for example, which is also very cheesy. Also, there's the Great Spine Dragon. This one's quite a bit more famous as being a kind of a legendary collector's edition and is also a fabulous sculpt. Some of the other really brilliant dragons in this range, including one that perhaps nearly rivals the Lava Dragon in my affection, the Serpentine Dragon, is unfortunately just a bit too small to look sensible on a modern or indeed even old-fashioned Warhammer Fantasy battlefield, because some of the dragons were sadly rather tiny. The Lava Dragon has got very good use on the battlefield. He's tended to represent the special character Golroch in my Chaos Army. The only problem with him is 
that as a very complicated and very heavy lead miniature, he's getting a bit weak and fragile now after being transported around in a box, which might limit his future appearance on battlefields, or at least battlefields where he has to travel. Next, we've got these Jess Goodwin Ogres, and unlike those dragons, these are very celebrated and very well remembered. They were probably getting on for 20 models in the Jess Goodwin Ogre range, but we've got 12 of the best of them here. Here we've got three of my favourites. Two of them on the left were actually personalities from the Citizel combat cards. In the centre here you've got Scrag the Slaughterer, who actually reappeared a long time later as an Ogre special character, but this is a very famous model and a really cool one, to which I added a shield from the Warmonger miniature range. Then to his left you've got Gutlag the Ogre Shaman. He had no hand and no foot when I got him, but I added the hand of a vermin lord and the foot of Arbol the Undefeated's Flesh Hound to restore them. On the right, that's the so-called Chaos Ogre, which I added a contemporary shield to, which I thought really fitted him. Here we've got Molthog, Rothieg, and the Bounty Hunter. I can't really remember his name. But suffice to say, three other really cool Ogre models, showing lots of dynamism of pose. Three more really distinct ones here. We've got the Pirate Ogre with his eye patch and his hook and his peg leg. Then we've got the Ogre Bandit there on the right hand side. And then in the middle we've got the Ogre Executioner who is one of my favourite of these Ogre sculpts. This was actually one of the earliest miniatures that I painted for the army and I still really like it now. The banner I must admit I do slightly struggle to explain. All I can say is that the guy on the banner is Pope Sixtus V, and as for the words, well, I just think it's very amusing the idea of a bunch of ogres filibustering emotion. Moving from ogres to dragon ogres, these are actually models from around 1992, and I did them mainly out of playing Ninth Age, and in Ninth Age, Feldrax, which are the legacy equivalent of Dragon Ogres, are a rather good unit for the Warriors of the Dark Gods, and so I decided to paint a regiment of them as a kind of lockdown project. Now, these models are not my favourites compared to many of the 1980s sculpts, but nonetheless I do really like them, and they were very enduring, very long-running sculpts, which I believe were used literally right up until 8th edition, having a very, very long shelf life. There isn't quite as much variety on miniature to miniature with these as there are with some of the old hammer sculpts or as many different poses. So I tried to get as much variety on these models as I could to help differentiate them from each other. That meant painting some of the dragon parts of the ogres different colours and also including details like some shields on some of the models. Also, I tried hard to improve my painting of metallics on these miniatures, something I'm not really very good at, and with the bronze in particular, I managed, I think, to get a rather better finish than with some of my older paint jobs. With the banner, I didn't have any particularly great ideas, but I wanted to put some fire on it because I thought that that would suit the colour scheme of the regiment. And in the end, I had the idea of making it look all a bit sort of constrained and imprisoned, thinking as I do that dragon ogres are rather miserable creatures. Next up, we've got 32 Chaos Thugs, or Marauders as they would later become known. Now, there were three aesthetic themes in the 1980s that Chaos Thugs really revolved around. The first were thugs that looked really like quite simplified Chaos Warriors, and there are a lot of those actually in my three Chaos Warrior units. The second was a really quite original and cool one, which was a sort of kind of punk road warrior kind of theme, you know, with definite sort of Mad Max kind of influences. And the third, which is what I've gone for in this unit, are Barbarians. This was partly inspired by playing the Ninth Age, where the kind of legacy equivalent to Marauders are Barbarians. Also, of course, later editions of Warriors of Chaos would kind of feature that kind of more Viking, chaos wasty kind of theme a little bit more, although that had no bearing on my decision to go down the kind of Barbarian route. Now most of the models in this unit are Citadel ones, although there are also some from a few other manufacturers like Grenadier here and there. 
There are some fantastic models, I think, in this unit that really kind of capture a true barbarian kind of feeling. You've got the sort of Conan equivalent there in the front rank and all manner of others. Some of them are varying ages. You've got some older guys in here and also quite a few women as well, which really suits barbarians, I think. Now, the main colour scheme for our barbarian unit, naturally enough, is going to be flesh coloured, simply because barbarians are, generally speaking, largely naked. However, for their weapons and also for some of their cloth, I used pinks and blues. And some of them have also got some really quite cool, I think, face paint on them. Once again, there are no duplicates in this unit. Every single metal model was unique. And this is one of the things I think that people really love about the 1980s. Later in the middle hammer kind of era, while metal sculpts were still primarily what people were using, there were usually only three or four different kinds of variations for each of the troops. Whereas with a lot of the old hammer units, you're talking about 20, 30 or 40 different variations. And so you didn't really have to actually repeat models very often. Now, sometimes this unit is led by none other than Thrud the Barbarian, as you can see here, riding on a war platform or a disc. Now, Thrud the Barbarian was one of the very famous personalities of the 1980s because he actually appeared in a comic strip in White Dwarf, which was, and still is in my view, very amusing. Thrud, with his massive muscles, tiny head and tiny brain, really screams old hammer cheesiness. Now, the banner on this unit also features Thrud. I didn't want to have anything kind of too out there or chaotic or conceptual for a unit of what are fundamentally barbarians. So just Thrud in front of a village on some hills I thought was appropriate. I did originally have That'll Teach You, which is something of a catchphrase of Thrud, written on the banner, but the letters looked crap and I ended up painting over it and haven't got round to replacing it. Next up, we've got five Marauder Horsemen. Now, these were only troops that had a genesis in a later Chaos Army book, but the materials were there from 1980s sculpts to create, I think, a rather cool looking unit of them. So the horses I used here are all metal horses, Marauder horses, in fact, that were used for the Marauder Chaos Knights. Now, the Marauder horses are a little bit smaller and more donkey-like than the Citadel horses that you'll see in a minute, and so I decided that they would be perfect for light cavalry. Now, these horses really represented a great opportunity to go to town on creating really extravagant colour schemes. They're really fantastic, simple, blocky kinds of sculpts that you can build up layers on like there's no tomorrow. As for the riders, well, some of them are, of course, Chaos Thugs. You've got a slightly more punky kind of guy there with his um, sort of mace on a chain. You've then got a guy actually wielding a shotgun who is actually not a Citadel sculpt at all, but something a bit more contemporary, who I thought might be a bit appropriate because I always like to put in the odd sort of 40k kind of weapon here and there in the Chaos Army. And then finally on the right, you've got Thrud the Barbarian again. There are actually two Thrud sculpts in this army of the three classic Thruds that Games Workshop made. This one I'm even more fond of. I think he looks hilarious riding a tiny horse that would have no chance of bearing his enormous weight, and again, all a bit cartoony. Now, the banner on this unit I have mixed feelings about. It depicts a girl called Opal, who was transported to a mysterious dystopian future world where she got merged with a computer which is all very cool, but perhaps a little bit too sophisticated and emotional for an essentially quite comedic kind of unit and a comedic kind of model-like thrud. And one day I'd like to place this banner in perhaps a more appropriate home and allow thrud to carry perhaps a cheesier banner which is more appropriate to him. In most of the games I've fought with Warriors of Chaos, this model has been my battle standard bearer. Now next here we have a very personal entry, which is the so-called Zotamental. Now, this is a combination of the legs of a Zote and the torso of an Earth Elemental. That's a pretty cool 80s conversion. Now, it's very personal to me because a very good friend of mine called Julius actually gave this model to me. It was a conversion that he had done probably as around a 10-year-old. And we always used to talk about the Zotamental years and years ago, including before I played Warhammer. And when he heard that I was starting to play again, he gave it to me. I actually think it's a really cool conversion and certainly very impressive for a 10-year-old. 
It wasn't too difficult to get the two bits to fit together quite well, just using a few pieces of putty to cover over the join. And then painted it in the traditional kind of green colour scheme with a heavily contrasting kind of stomach in pink. The Zotamental has generally been used to represent a Chaos Spawn and occasionally a Demon Prince in 8th edition. Now I'm a big fan of armies being very personal to the people that collect them. And of course you don't need to play Old Hammer to be able to access that. Sometimes there's a little story behind a particular model or maybe a particular conversion. And that could be a story to do with you and the hobby, or it could even symbolise just things that have happened in your life and in your past. And I'm very wedded to the idea that an army is something organic and something human, and tells the story of the gamer who painted it and collected it as well. Now, next up are my Chaos Knights, and while they're not my favourite unit in the army, I do think that if I had to nominate one to submit to a best painted competition, I would probably choose this one, because I think that the colour scheme and the execution on this unit is to date probably the most successful one in my Warriors of Chaos army. Now first of all we have to talk about the horses, which in some ways are the real star in this army. Now there are three really iconic solid metal citadel horse sculpts, and some of these horses, in particular the one which has armour that obscures its eyes, actually inspired some of the Chaos Knights years and years later. And they're large, they're menacing, and they've got lots of individual sort of compartmentalised areas in them that you can build up the highlights on. And I wanted to have all three in this unit. Now as for the riders, they are also I think quite interesting. Now three of them are actually just Chaos Knights who were sold with the horses. The chap there in the middle is a one piece Chaos Knight clutching his lance very closely to him and he's got one of those warmonger shields with him. The chap on the far right and the chap second from left are actually the multi-part Chaos Knights. There were some multi-part Chaos Warrior infantry as well, but perhaps better known are the multi-part Chaos Knights. And I chose the hands and the torsos to give some additional variety. The other two models in this unit are ones that I converted. The chap on the left who is on the horse holding the standard bearer is one of the actually very early 1980s Chaos Warriors who actually has a solid shield sculpted onto the model and I wanted to find a place for him somewhere in the army and so with a lot of bending about I just about managed to get it so that he could mount a horse. The guy there with the bone armour who's second from the left was one of the champions of Chaos who I desperately wanted to put in my army somewhere. And I had the idea, inspired by a conversion someone else had done on an old hammer model, to try and build up the head of his horses with kind of a bone conversion to sort of fit in with his bone armour. There was then also one of the plastic shields which had a bone theme on it as well, so that was the sensible choice for him. This model, despite being a foot Chaos Champion, fitted fantastically on the horse, and I think it's one of my favourite models in the army. There are two hand-painted shields on this unit. One of them a kind of sort of blue face with red lips, which complements the Warmonger shield. And then what might be, I think, my favourite hand-painted shield in the army is this green one here with this slightly leering, pallid guy with his big nose. I'm also fond of these because by the time I did them, I'd done enough hand-painted shields to work out roughly what I could do with them. And so I was able to come up with my own designs rather than using reference material that someone else had done. The banner was one very much where I conformed to type. Sexy lady and a cheesy kind of slogan, who's afraid of the dark? Next, here's a model that's not actually an old Hammer model at all, but a modern Reaper miniature. Now, the reason I'm including this here is that I wanted to get a model that had an electric guitar somewhere into the army, because I thought that really suited the kind of heavy metal theme, and there weren't really too many obvious candidates that I could find. And so in the end, I actually found this Reaper miniature, who is a bard, and converted her from a sort of a medieval looking taverny kind of bard into something that looked a bit more latexy and power metal-y. Miss Mirror, as she became known, also became the Dark Elf in my Chaos Renegades Blood Bowl team, but she's also the lady who appears in the pink horror banner Smash the Mirror. Now, last but by no means least, we've got the wretched demon Seductus the Deprived himself. 
Now, this is of course the Keeper of the Secrets model from the original Greater Demon range, all four of which are absolutely fabulous sculpts which I'd like to eventually paint. But I knew that I always wanted to use this model to represent a demon prince in my Warriors of Chaos army, and sometimes a Keeper of Secrets as well. I really like this model. It's got vibes of cow, boobs, S&M, piercing, latex and leather, and pointing at the opposition. It's a really, really cool sculpt, and I think one of the best Oldhammer sculpts that's ever been produced, and to me, really knocks spots of all of the subsequent Keeper of the Secrets for the way that it embodies and combines all of these themes. Now, like with my Chimera, I've also got a bit of history with this guy. However, it's all a bit more complicated. Suffice to say, he's let me down on many occasions by blowing himself up, and we've got into all manner of arguments with each other. But that's absolutely fine. He is, after all, a demon. Right, that's all folks, and thank you very much for sitting through this rather long personal description of my army. Needless to say, if you like this video or any of my other ones, please do like, comment and subscribe to my YouTube channel, which really encourages me to keep making content. Thanks very much and good night.